Yes, I am because we are. Uh, thank you that uh, joined us uh, today in today's uh, an African uh, history call. You can see that we're still uh, have a low number. You can uh, we can try to invite our friends and family also uh, to join us. So as usual, we start uh, our our meetings uh, with a prayer. I'm going to go ahead and pray in my uh, local language, uh, which is uh, Kinyaranda. Yes, let's pray. We take a man and Ziza, from Shimita Bimbaje, Kumisonina, Kumisutrika Rakabise, Kumiza Utrin, the Mutio Kora, the Mumisha, Sutia Baje, Mesia Yasukusu. Amen. Yes, uh, we are going to have our first uh, speaker, uh, who is. Um, Mulesu Joseph uh, from uh, South Sudan. After Joseph, we're going to have uh, Montili uh, from uh, uh, Zambia. Yes. Uh, Joseph, can you hear us? You can unmute yourself. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh... We are Africans, my brothers and sisters from all over Africa. Uh, African migration, the opportunities, the challenges, and their relationship to African unity. So uh, my, my focus today is really going to be on South Sudan. As we know, my country has undergone a lot of uh, migration. And that, unfortunately, largely is due to uh, conflict or war. However, there are other South Sudanese who emigrate in search of good services and high standards of living, particularly in the areas of education and healthcare. Data shows that uh, we have the highest immigration rate in Africa at minus 19.8 or 1,000 population, which actually generates more than uh, 2.3 million refugees and asylum seekers. So this rate is said to be decreasing as conditions improve in the country and some refugees that enter return home. Regardless of uh, what the causes are, however, immigration or migration will always have negative and uh, positive impacts. And in our case, South Sudan particularly, it has presented us with a lot of opportunities particularly access to quality services. And we find that most of our people who have moved outside of their country, whether it's by war or in search of better opportunities, have actually been able to access quality education and healthcare services in neighboring countries, particularly Uganda and Kenya. And generally, those who are financially able have been able to enjoy high standards of living as a result. Again, we all see economic benefits. Uh, you see that most of our people who are well to do due to the conflict and other reasons, they move their families to neighboring countries and so bring with them a lot of wealth to those countries that contribute to the economic growth of those countries and ultimately, of course, improve the whole economy of the region. And that definitely is positive to the countries where these people move. And those who are also able to find jobs, the country where they move to, are able to improve the quality life and standard of living, so that is definitely positive. Another key area is the cultural exchange. As these people move, they try to learn to live and coexist with different cultures, and this ultimately contributes to an environment of existence, and then we hope that this will ultimately in the end translate to peace, because what we need in Africa is peace, because our country may be really struggle in conflicts every Despite that a positive uh, impacts of migration, there has been uh, a negative side to this, particularly when we see increased violence and conflicts, because especially for refugees when they come to those communities due to differences in culture and sometimes stage of resources, there is conflict between refugees and host, and this is not necessarily a very good thing. However, it offers opportunities for understanding and ultimately achievement of peace as these people. 
to learn to live together. Another challenge, and this particularly to South Sudan, is the repatriation of wealth. For those of you who are familiar with South Sudan, South Sudan has a large population of immigrants from all over the world, including Africa. So what happens is that these people are highly paid compared to South Sudanese and NGOs and businesses, and also they repatriate most of their wealth and don't reinvest in the country. So this leaves the country impoverished, all right? And the people struggle with poverty because of that. So in the end, we will find that also we, we import most of the finished goods and produce very few, except for raw materials, which we export cheaply, while we import expensively, leaving our country with deficit, you know, trade deficits year in, year out. And so the inflation is high and people struggle. So this immigration in this sense is very positive. And uh, thirdly, we see economic hardships, which I already touched on, but particularly refugees at the moment who are in the camps, who don't have jobs, and uh, there's a cut uh, reduction in funding due to many other priorities in the world. There's uh, less, less money coming to fund refugee programs. And so this really creating a lot of problems, hunger, starvation, and suicide rates going high. Recently, uh, NHR released a report which put uh, the number of suicides to 86% for males and 15% for females as a result of these challenges. So you can definitely see that there's a lot of uh, problem here as a result of this forced migration of people. However, uh, in spite of all these challenges, we know that we can be able to make the most of this phenomenon, particularly as Africans learn to live together, to coexist, to interact, and to move across borders. That has a, a, an impact to create what cultural understanding and appreciation of different cultures and ethnicities. And in the end, this will lead to actually peaceful coexistence, which we need in Africa, and that will the final analysis uh, contribute to the unity of African people and, and as, as governments also begin to allow free movement of people across borders, as uh, the people get to learn to live and trade among each other, travel and live and work in different countries and do businesses, that, that continues to Africa. And so the key point for me here is that the cultural exchange as a result of this migration is very important because it is the one that will facilitate the unity of the African people. In my language, and this is what I want to conclude with, people say, Nabot or Narok Oiwara, which it translates in English that as you move, bad things and good things happen. So my recommendation is that we can minimize the bad impacts of uh, migration and uh, make the most of the good uh, results or impacts of uh, migration. And as a such, we can contribute we can move towards the unit of the African people. Thank you very much. I am because we are. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Joseph Mulesuku from uh, South Sudan. Thank you for that wonderful report. I am because you are. Up next, we are going to have our brother, uh, Raymond Fidi from uh, Zambia. Yes, Raymond, can you hear us? You can unmute yourself. Uh, good, good afternoon, Yvonne, and good afternoon, everyone. I am yes, because we, we are. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, you have uh, three minutes to present your report. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I'll first start with the, my country, Zambia, when it comes to the issue of migration. Uh, in the before Zambia became independent, it was under the Southern and Northern Odisha Confederation under the colonialists. And most people from Zambia, that time under the Confederation of Odisha, it was Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. The colonialists had set up their, their capital what is now Zimbabwe. That time it was Rhodesia, and the capital was Salisbury. 
So he had a lot of Zambians that time and Malawians flocking to that time Rhodesia looking for job opportunities because the capital was in a Rhodesia now called Zimbabwe and the capital of Salisbury. So he had a lot of that, that time, I don't know, the Northern, Rhodesia, no, the Northern Rhodesians and the, that time Malawi also was uh, in Nyasaland under that go. So most of them migrated to now called Zimbabwe in search of who? job opportunities and most of them actually move and i can say that my grandfathers from both my mother and my father actually moved to zimbabwe to go and look for work and my parents actually were born some of my mother was born actually in the now called zimbabwe but they originally came from zambia but because that time, uh, there were a lot of what we call civil rights movements. There were a lot of Zambians involved in, uh, you know, that time most countries were trying to fight for independence. And most of the freedom fighters from Zambia, Malawi, used to go to try and talk to the colonialists in Zimbabwe, which was the capital that time. So my, 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 cause my grandfather, they hosted some of these freedom fighters from uh, that time, Northern Rhodesia and Nyasaland. Uh, my grandfather actually used to host some of these freedom fighters, and my uncles were involved in the uh, civil rights movement. And because of they were actually deported from uh, Northern Rhodesia to come back to, I mean, from uh, uh, South, Southern Rhodesia that time, back to Northern Rhodesia, which was Zambia. So they, that's how come they came back because of being involved in the fight for civil rights and political freedom. So because of that, Zambia has got a history actually when it gained independence of hosting uh, or helping a lot of uh, neighboring countries. That time they were not yet independent. So when Zambia became independent, it, ho it started hosting a lot of refugees from the surrounding countries and it actually helped in the fight uh, for them to gain independence. So the migration of most of the surrounding countries into Zambia was because of uh, political instability where these uh, people were before they gained independence. So you find even after these surrounding countries gained independent, independent, some of them decided to remain in Zambia. Some of them were actually born in Zambia and became Zambians. I'll cite examples like the Angolans, the Angolans, also the Angolans, also the Congolese. You can name even, oh, most of uh, the countries in Africa, actually, they are represented in Zambia. Zambia is more like uh, that time in, in America, when there was slavery, we had the new, or which had the, the, the because of uh, the southern part of America was uh, still supporting slavery, whilst the northern part of America had uh, uh, stopped slavery. So you had a lot of uh, slaves from the south going into New York because New York had stopped a lot. So most of them, when they get into New York, they were free. So I'm trying to give an example of Zambia. Most people yes, ran away from the surrounding Simon, country. You have 30 seconds left. And found a refugee in Zambia. So, in this air, uh, within 30, 30 seconds, we also have Zambians also who have migrated out of Zambia for economic reasons. We had uh, most of them of Zambians have migrated to South Africa because of the economic opportunities offered in South Africa, Botswana. Because at that time, Zambia, in terms of education, had educated a lot of people before these surrounding countries became independent. So some of them went there for economic opportunities, job opportunities, they had teachers, they had the doctors who have gone into South Africa, Botswana, and other surrounding countries for job opportunities and economic opportunities. We have most Zambians actually in South Africa. I think they've gone there because of the conducive economic opportunities there. So I think in conclusion, 
I think we need to open up the borders because the borders actually, uh, they were put up actually to stop us Africans from mixing. It's more like uh, the colonial law of public order act, which was meant to stop Africans that time during the colonialism from mixing together or holding traditional ceremonies. That was meant actually to stop them from getting to know each other. And in, because of that, you know, you find that uh, I'm trying to compare public order act with the borders and the migration and the visa. Meant, it's meant to stop us from integrating. So I think with the coming of the African uh, continental free trade area and the, the issue of one passport, one, one, one passport mm -hmm. to actually help us to integrate and develop quickly on the lines of uh, the European Union, the, what, what the, the Schengen system, which allows anyone within the European Union, as long as you've got a Schengen pass, you can go anywhere without having a passport. So that's what we need also in Africa if we have to integrate. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Raymond C. Uh, from uh, Zambia. I am because we are. Thank you for the wonderful report. Up next, we're going to have our brother, uh, Bokari Mara uh, from Rebellia. Yes, Bokari, can you hear us? You can unmute yourself. Yeah, good afternoon. Yes, Bokari. Yes. yes, we can hear you. You're welcome. I'm Miss Bokari Mara from Sierra Leone. Yes, um, welcome. when we talk yes. about in Africa, when, at, when we talk about that, in Africa, many people nowadays are going out in many parts of the world, including around Africa, so far and so on. So, mostly, some are going to for a storing purpose, and some are going for economic purpose in terms of employment. So, in Africa, it's about 30 million people today are traveling from one place to another. So we have an international body that is carrying out the day-to-day -day affairs in migrations like the United Nations Migration Agencies. They are trying to put in an effort just for, for just to cut the the immigrants around Africa. So probably the effort of African states and international institutes to enhance regional integration. Africa, today, we need to be self-reliance and we need to build up our self government for a for us to African to go out of our own continent just for sake on employment. So like Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone today we have we have many immigrants that are, going, that are going out just because you look out the current economics in Africa, many youth and they are going out for just to go and see a better life. Related within unrecognized, most African migration occur when the continent has migrant set employment opportunity in neighboring region. Economies of like America, China, the, the Great and United Kingdom. So when you look at the percentage, it's about 80% of African migrants are not have an interest 
living dignity, but just because of a lack of economic purpose, there are no way unless they go out to fend their daily bread. The issues include human rights, economic opportunity, labor shortage, and unemployment bring green multiculturalism. So today, the main purpose for some Africans that yes. are going out for 30 seconds. To seek, huh? Yes, 30 seconds left. You can uh, finish up with your report. Come again. You have 30 seconds left. You can uh, finish up with your report. Okay, okay. But in Africa, like Sierra Leone, most students are going out in China just to seek um, language barrier and lack of employment opportunity, housing, um, access to medical service, transportations, and then cultural affiliations. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, brother uh, from Sierra Leone, Bukarimara. I am because you are. Thank you for that uh, wonderful report. Up next, you're going to have our brother from Ghana, Shahid Kasim. Yes, uh, Shahid Kasim, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you, madam. Okay, you're welcome. You have uh, three minutes to present your report. Yeah, good afternoon to our African contingents on this level platform. We are privileged once again to build the opportunity to look at the topic, the impact of intra-African migration, including its opportunities and challenges, and how it relates to the idea of African unity. It is important that God has protected human beings in unique ways and in different opportunities. And as a continent, no country in Africa can be self reliant. We, we need we need each other. Ghanaians need Nigerians for survival. Nigerians need Senegalese for survival. Senegalese needs Zambia for survival. Everybody needs the other for survival. Why is it that? Here in Africa, there is a limited among Africans. The level of Afrophobia in Africa is serious. And this problem was caused by our colonial masters. For it is they that divided Africa, they passed Africa among themselves, as we all know in the, 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 the Beijing conference. This has made Ghanaians as enemies. When they come into the country, when the Kambis come into Ghana, the level of condensation method them in Ghana is so serious. And the vice versa, we try to alienate ourselves from them. Anytime they are described in our country, we see it to be um, a threat to our progress because we feel that the country Ghana belongs to Ghanaians and it's not belong to this. Meanwhile, we claim we are independent nations. So there are so many challenges regarding movement of people from one country, uh, from, uh, movement of Africans from one country to another. All these the four independent African, African countries, it is difficult to move from Ghana to other places. Really. So, as a president, this little change can be kept by as time as much as possible to get a single document that can allow us to move freely 
in Africa. The one reason that I think we can tackle on is our educational system. Ghana, Africa has the resources that they need to build Africa. But why is it that day in, day out, people need the source of Africa to the United States to look for white color jobs? This is because we don't have a good education system. This is because the people in Africa lost trust in the administration, the government, the government system in, 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 in Africa. So it is important for us to restructure our education system, make room for entrepreneurship, industrialization. So that our continent can move forward. Ladies and gentlemen, on this note, um, let me take you once again to um, ten greetings once again for Africa, my African contingents on the platform. Thank you for the opportunity once again. I am because we are. Yes, thank you very much. I am because uh, that was uh, our brother from Ghana, uh, Shahid Kasim. Thank you for that wonderful report. Yes, up next, we are going to have uh, our brother from uh, South Sudan, uh, Wani Isaac. Yes, Isaac, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, you're welcome. You have uh, three minutes to present your report. Yeah. Okay, thank you all. I greet you all in the name of Carlo uh, This is Mr. Wana Isaac from South Sudan. I'll be presenting uh, on the same thing, which is the uh, intra African uh, migration. Uh, so, as we understand, uh, this is a movement of people from country to country within the African continent for different purposes. So, here we are saying there are different reasons why they are moving in the uh, different countries. Some could be uh, the causes could be maybe due to the good international cooperation uh, between the different countries where they are moving. Uh, uh, so where there's peace, we understand that people are looking for places where there's peace and also so that they go on in, in something or maybe they go on. Yes, uh, Isa. Uh, the importance of the camp where the movement happens is when authority brings in urbanization, where many people come. Uh, there's also uh, the industrial uh, development. Uh, many ideas came in, comes in. Uh, people come and invest in so that they uh, bring in new opportunities for uh, the people who are in the country, like employment opportunities. Uh, also, uh, we understand there is cultural diversity. Uh, people come in so that uh, they share their cultural differences and uh, understand the different cultures that they are also entering to. Uh, uh, there are many points regarding the importance, but I may on, only say those points. And we also understand that there are few challenges that are facing, that are uh, uh, being faced during this uh, immigration. We understand that there are people moving with a good reason. There are some who are moving with bad reasons. Those ones coming in with bad reasons may bring in insecurity to the countries where they are, the cities where they're moving to. Also, there is, there'll be high cost of living. We understand, especially in South Sudan here, there are many people coming to South Sudan to invest. So as there are many investors, uh, the community where uh, the community where they come and reside in, they are being displaced also as they are displaced that they bring in the investment and through government the land of those uh, people are taken uh, so that they are, these, uh, these are investors are uh, settled in number three also as we understand these community members are being pushed to the uh, to the lower level or in, uh, in the villages here in the town because the investors are many the cost of living keeps on going very high 
and also we understand that there are some who are moving due to a crisis in the countries. There's also due to insecurity. So uh, as refugees are coming in, the, the refugees are coming, some of them are having good options. Uh, they are coming to settle in this new country. Uh, there are some coming to the new country, but uh, they are unable to survive. So insecurity also comes in. So basically, uh, this, these are the few points that I would like to put across. Uh, this is where I'm going to end. I am because we are. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, our brother uh, from uh, South Sudan. Thank you for that wonderful report and uh, the insight about uh, that particular topic. And uh, we are also live from Facebook. Uh, if you have any question, you can uh, write in the comment section, then we will be able to get back to you. Yes, I saw that our brother Yazid uh, was having some uh, insights. Uh, they can uh, unmute themselves and uh, share with us what they think. Yes, Yazid, can you hear us? Yes, you can uh, unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Yes, I can see. Uh, yes, up next, we're going to have our brother here, Alfred Komba. Yes, uh, Alfred, can you hear us? Yes. Yes, you, you are welcome. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, uh, wherever you find yourself. Um, from, from the discussion ongoing, I think I want to, first of all, congratulate us for being together all this work to see how we can discuss an issue relating to unification, which is very important. I am from Sierra Leone and I want to believe I am also from Ghana, I'm from Nigeria, I'm from everywhere in Africa because I saw myself as one Africa. So um, from the discussion, um, it, it's certain and I'm sure it's just that uh, there have been several changes with Africans, especially when you think about what are some of the reasons for our movement, what are some of the reasons for the challenge we are facing now in Africa to unify us. Uh, from the general perspective, I think, first of all, like I saw a, a recent agreement between Ghana and South Africa that uh, they will be using a passport free uh, um, visa free to, to get into this country. It should not be like a two-man show. We are expecting unification to be everywhere. Every state in Africa should be seen as one. Nobody should be restricted. To me, I even require no passport. I just require citizen to come. As far as you have something to identify you as an African, that is okay for us to access each country. But people live in Africa as a result of the challenges we are facing when already the weight people there or uh, the Europeans, they are coming to Africa to get what will make them beautify yeah, their country, yeah. um, their continent. And Africa is being left out as a result of poor management, leadership struggles, and all the likes. Youth are migrating from one continent to another. That. And you can see the challenges they face when they get to this country, some being badly maltreated and things. However, it is, it is eminent and it's very, very prominent that to start correcting some of these things that we thought they are already from the other parts of the country of the world. Africa, we have the resources to renovate, rejuvenate our stance ensure we rebrand the mindset of us, the youth, especially the youth. Sometimes when I keep talking to Africans, I really want youth to be the, 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 the listener because they are the change maker. They are those who can effect the actual change we needed, even though the leadership has a role to play, which is very good, but I'm sure if the youth are against the leader for bad leadership, then things will be rectified. So I am pleading and also giving a word of caution. Let's see the youth as the change maker and let the youth realize themselves that they can effect the change from the leadership and they can demand a change from the leadership. And it's sure if we unify to bring the change, the entire Africa will be unified. The elderly people will understand that indeed this is our own and belongs to us. The value needs should be entrusted in our youth and hence, 
the movement will be limited somehow. There are beautification that, again, this movement needs to recommend to leadership. I saw in one or two discussions that we are not political. Yes, we are not political, but we need to take the necessary move to meet with our leaders and explain our stand positively and see how best that can be utilized. When some of them among the leadership started to realize that Africa can be the best in the world, some of the leaders, example like uh, the, the, the Gaddafi from Libya, you understand he had a, a vision. I always use him as an example because of his vision. But because of some other things within Africa, I won't say it was gone. Today is no more. So for us to bring back, revive everything, we need kind of negotiation. We need to have this movement move to certain stakeholders, especially decision makers in uh, in the various states in Africa, to talk to them, let them realize themselves that we can move to another stage. I think for now, I want to say I am. We are because we are one people. I am not Sierra Leonean, but I'm African, and I'm Ghanaian, and uh, that is it for now. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Ia uh, Komba. Thank you for that uh, wonderful insight. And uh, our brother from uh, um, Uganda was uh, like, um, but this is a very interesting topic to dive into. I wish uh, found time to be among the, the participants. Uh, across the borders, relationship is very cardinal in Africa uh, because of economics and uh, social meltdown of such nation. Uh, one has to put in mind that some of African nations were uh, same before colonial uh, domination. In fact, some share the same currency and social culture identification, yeah, which is true. I prefer the nation, uh, the relation between Niger Republic and Nigeria with resounding border closure. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Yazid, for that one wonderful insight. So you're going to continue with the Pan-African uh, healthcare class uh, with uh, Nana Akua. If you'd like to receive a shout out from her, you know what to do. You can just turn on your camera. Yes, you're welcome, Nana Akua. So, hello. Hey, Yvonne. How are you? Yes, I'm fine. How about you? I am great. And hey there. Homba and Mara and Jacob. Okay, and there's some peeking. If <laughs> okay, so greeting everyone. And uh, also like Facebook. Oh, so we have a lot of people following us from oh, Facebook. Oh. Hey, Facebook. So welcome everyone. I am glad that you all are joining us for this week with our Pan-African Healthcare Lecture, Hazel. And I am going to continue from last week. We discussed last about identifying stress and how to manage stress and be well and able to function in this very stressful world and uh, still be productive and still be happy and healthy. Uh, mentally, physically, and and emotionally. And so today, I want to see if I can pull up. Um, and I hope I have pulled up the correct lecture. Oh yeah, and I do think this is where I sort of left off last time. So we mentioned some of the uh, herbs that are calming herbs or what we call nervine herbs or sedative herbs. Uh, and I think we were gonna talk a little bit more uh, as we have before about flower remedies or flower essences. And so these are, um, I think really important. Um, and I think it's good to know how to 
handle difficult situations, situations that will spike our emotions or spark different emotions. And we know that things that can cause stress will evoke different types of emotions. So it may be um, anger, it may be fear, it may be uh, sadness or sorrow or grief. Um, it might make us become irritable. Um, so many emotions that we can feel at any given time, right? And so I wanted to really highlight as I usually do uh, at this point, how important our emotional well-being is. And so it's important to really keep track of that and really learn how to handle our emotions. Uh, I don't believe in being long suffering, right? Meaning I don't believe in, in us uh, as individuals, uh, as families, as communities, just suffering through something on a really long ongoing basis. Uh, we have to figure how to handle it. Some things are just what they are and how they are, uh, and we can't change them. But there are many things that we can change, um, or at least our responses to it, or our reactions to it, or how we feel about it. So, of course, we know we can't make people uh, be a certain way or do a certain thing. Um, but we can't control how we respond to it, how we feel about it. And so when we're talking about emotional health and managing our emotions or managing stress, that is precisely what I'm referring to. We have to take charge of our reaction, our responses to things, right? So if we find ourselves feeling gloomy or sad about a situation, uh, even if it's something we can work towards changing until we get to that point and we can change it, we have to still feel better and be able to function and still find joy and peace, right? And tranquility. The flower essences, I think are an excellent way to start that. If we get into um, uh, things that help balance our emotions, I think that we'll be better equipped um, and be happier human beings. And so flower essences, just like we've talked about herbs in the past, the flower essences or the flower remedies, as they're also called, are basically the flowering parts of trees and shrubs that help to balance various emotions that I've made mention of already, right? And so usually this is taken sort of in a homeopathic way, and if you remember some previous classes, we talked about herbs and we talked about homeopathy. We've talked about how to take homeopathic remedies. We know this is taken what we call sublingually, which means under our tongues, um, where there are tablets or uh, drops of medicine that are put under the tongue and then allowed to be absorbed into the body through the mucous membranes in the mouth. So this gives a more direct uh, uh, absorption into the body through the bloodstream, as opposed to uh, an herbal capsule or tea or tincture that we're swallowing and it getting into the, our systems through the gastrointestinal tract. So different kind of process. And this is more direct. So this is well suited for um, sort of acute situations where you need immediate responses, right? And so homeopathy is excellent for that. And we know that things um, sublingually will get a quicker response time. And a lot of we need that when we are feeling irritated, we're sad, when we're grieving, um, when, we're, uh, when we're frightened. All of these days, uh, or if we're just sort of, you know, we're despondent, we're not really feeling any sort of meh, you know, or blah, right? So these remedies, uh, this handout just focuses on the um, 38 English flower remedies. However, there are 42 Australian flower remedies and uh, it's gonna be so many to go through. Uh, we really um, 
we'll just kind of go through some of these, but just know that there are even more than these 38 that we're focusing on today. But it's important to take note. And the way that they are described here will be sort of the negative presentation or the negative um, attributes of, of this feeling of this emotion that this flower remedy addresses. So it may not be your best feeling about a certain thing, or it may not make you feel <laughs> proud about uh, admitting that this is how you're feeling, but it's necessary. And it's only you would know, right? It's ourselves that know our innermost workings and our innermost feelings, right? So it's okay. If you identify with even these negative aspects, know that, of course, it is the uh, opposite that is going to allow you to feel. Uh, and I'll probably switch out my handouts and, and give the one that gives the negative attribute and then the positive attribute. But if you can just sort of follow along, you'll I think you'll get the gist of what issues these things will help with. So let's just talk about, we may as well start with the first, agrimony. Agrimony is um, a tree uh, where the flowering part of it helps people who are suffering inner torture right? People who uh, hide behind a sunny face, they have this facade of cheerfulness, but they're really kind of wearing the mask. They're not really happy. They're not really okay putting on that front or they'll fade through. This is the remedy that will help you kind of get over that and really truly be happy and really truly be joyful or happy. So if you find yourself feeling like, oh, I'm the worst or this is horrible or I feel bad or things are all bad, uh, but let me just pretend so that people don't know uh, or people don't uh, worry or whatever reason, agrimony is going to be the remedy for you. Um, Aspen, this is for a person who kind of dreads just has this sort of um, apprehension and they just kind of dread going through their day uh, and whatever tasks they have, they have sort of unexplainable anxiety, right? Uh, just anxious and may go into a full panic attack or anxiety attack and not really know the reason. Aspen is good for this person. This helps to alleviate that type of panic or anxiety. Uh, beaches for someone who's highly critical and very arrogant and in, uh, um, intolerable uh, towards other people. These are people that have to be right. They think they know everything um, and they don't really tolerate other people with varying opinions. Beach is going to help turn that around and make you more accepting and tolerable of others and less critical. Uh, let's skip down to... Uh, Serato. Serato is excellent for people who have a lot of uh, self-doubt, like they don't trust their own judgment um, and they don't kind of trust their intuition, their inner voice. They often seek advice from other people rather than going along with sort of what their instinct or their intuition is telling them. These are people who are easily influenced and impressionable um, by others. Serato will help reverse that. Let's get to chestnut bud. This is for a person who refuses to learn from their experiences. Like you keep having bad situations at work or at home or in school or in the community, right? And you kind of repeat those same mistakes. And maybe you're not realizing it. You don't see the pattern. You don't see the warning signs or the red flags. Um, or you just feel like even though we know that this is a form of insanity, right? We know that you'll keep doing, when you keep doing things the same way, expecting a different result, we know that that's insanity, right? Whether knowingly or unknowingly, just nut bud is uh, for that type of person. Uh, this will help turn that situation around and you learn from your mistakes. You do a different routine. Uh, we talked last week about reevaluating your plan, your routines, your schedule, uh, your vision, your mission. This would be a remedy that would help you to do that so that you're able to do something different and change your outcome because you've changed up your routine, your patterns, and you've learned from your past mistakes. Um, 
let's go to crab apple. Um, crab apple is one of those remedies that's good for folk who um, have feelings of like personal disgust or shame. They may have made decisions. They may have fallen in victim of, you know, some predator that's taken advantage or done something to them or with them. And they just have a lot of self-hatred uh, or self-disgust. Um, they lack self-pride because of whatever circumstances. This kind of cleanses that person's emotional uh, being and kind of helps them to, uh, have a dis different disposition about those past mistakes. And it helps you kind of move past. Okay, I've made this uh, error in judgment, but let me move on. You know, let me move on and be able to do something different next time and identify those red flags and move on. Uh, Elm, we've talked about this before. I usually always kind of go through this one. Uh, I personally use this one. This treats that uh, person who, is just temporarily overwhelmed. You uh, feel like you can't kind of do your uh, daily chores, duties, responsibilities. You're normally able to do this, but you just feel like, okay, I can't do this. I'm incapable. Uh, I'm inadequate. I uh, am irresponsible. I just cannot do it. Usually this comes with a type of mental fatigue uh, where the stress kind of has you thinking, okay, I just can't. Um, Elm kind of helps you work through that. Um, Heather, I don't think I usually focus on Heather. Heather is a flower remedy that helps to treat people who are obsessed with their own troubles and experiences, right? These are people who just kind of self-absorbed or um, focus really on just themselves, their problems, their issues. These are not usually people that are good to talk to. They're not good listeners. Um, you know, they'll talk, talk, talk your head off, but they're not really giving anything. It's not an even exchange. If you find yourself, um, I, I know some people, a couple of people in my life where you'll walk in and they might just blur out something you off and they've changed the subject. They're focusing on whatever is in their head. Heather would be uh, the remedy for them. And, you know, they may say they don't intentionally do it to be rude, but because they're so in their own heads and their own issues and their own troubles, whatever is in their head, they'll blurt out. You might be in the middle of a, you know, personal uh, emotional story of something that's happening for you, but they're not focused. If you identify as that person, Heather is what you need. Um, let's talk about Holly. I don't think I usually highlight this one. Holly is for the person who's jealous, envious, vengeful, suspicious, um, your typical hater. Um, so this type of person may not identify for themselves that they need Holly, but you may have a friend or one, um, or maybe an enemy. Maybe you will gift them <laughs> a bottle of Holly. Um, and because we know that hate is real, there are a lot of people who are jealous and envious of others, maybe for some personal inadequacy. Um, but this is uh, a remedy that will help turn that around and over jealousy, that envy. And I wish it was that simple, right? We know that it won't be that simple. For somebody that's truly a hater, <laughs> it won't be as easy as, hey, you need to take some Holly. But maybe if they have a uh, come to Jesus moment, so to speak, right? Or they are uh, put in a situation where they are forced to uh, face their true self and they realize that, oh, okay, I, I really am just jealous. So I wish I had this type of situation. Let, let me, I don't want to be this person. Let me do that. It'd be nice, but that probably will be a little more challenging to get the person these Holly to actually take that. Impatient. Impatience is one that I've also personally used. Again, these are not positive attributes, but this is just what it is. This is for the person that's impatient. They get high, uh, highly agitated or irritable when things kind of don't go their way or in the order or speed uh, or time frame that they would like. Uh, this person is usually pretty melodramatic. 
you know, um, can be a little self-centered. They kind of like things done the way they want them, when they want it. These people are also prone to hypertension or high blood pressure. Um, so in addition to having a certain type of way of thinking, it also manifests uh, physiologically and causes certain conditions, like I said, like high blood pressure, um, possibly some other conditions that um, maybe hyperthyroidism or some other things that have to do with things moving too fast uh, within the body's functioning. Impatience is the flower remedy for that. Um, let's talk about minimalist is for the person that fears uh, things. And, and we know there are different types of fears. We know that there's fears of, of something in particular. We know that there are unknown fears, um, but this is for the person that uh, knows what it is um, that they're afraid of. So they may have a particular phobia or a fear of a particular thing or situation. Um, the shyness, uh, they're usually timid, bashful. Uh, so that, that kind of affects how you move about in the world. If you always have this fear of, of different situations and things, Mimilus will help correct that. Mustard is a good remedy. This is for the person who has sort of this dark cloud over them, right? You're just sort of always depressed. Um, you just, uh, you know, sad, low, down. Um, it's hard to feel kind of upbeat or uplifted. This remedy helps to really uplift and kind of revive or rejuvenate someone that has sort of a gloomy, dark cloud over them. Mustard is excellent for that. Uh, let's skip down a little bit. I don't usually talk about pine, so let's talk about pine. And we all know what pine needles are, or pine cones. Imagine using right, the essence of this tree to help us get over feelings of guilt, self-blame, uh, feelings of unworthiness, right? Uh, similar to another remedy we just mentioned, a lot of times we make mistakes or we have errors uh, in judgment, you know, in our decision-making. Uh, and we then feel guilty for it and we are ashamed. Uh, and we blame ourselves for any bad thing that then happens thereafter. Pine will help you to overcome that feeling. Red chestnut, this is excellent for someone who has excessive, um, that treats excessive care for or concern for others uh, that they hold dear. Now that may sound like not a bad thing, right? But sometimes we do things to our detriment. So this would be uh, the person who only focuses on others and will usually abandon their own self-care, right? So they're usually so involved in what is happening with their loved ones that they sort of neglect themselves. Uh, just very recently, I have a friend who is, his mother is ill and it of course has caused so much stress on his person that he himself became sick and had to go, you know, to urgent care and is 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 sick and kind of down. And so now you can't even go visit your mom and you can't work, you can't function because the stress and the other concern or worry for this other person is now affecting you and your ability to even care for them. And again, it's not to say don't care for other people, don't be responsible for other people, don't have concern for other people, but when it is out of, so out of balance that it's affecting your health and your well-being, you have to take something for it. Red chestnut is the answer to that. Now, let me just say, with these things, not everyone is going to warmly welcome uh, these types of remedies. Uh, so I do suggest starting with yourself. If there are things you identify for yourself, I suggest using them your, for yourself and seeing how wonderful they work. And, and I'm sure <laughs> if you pick the right remedy and you're honest with yourself in terms of what uh, emotional deficits you may have, you will see the benefit of this. 
and then you can tell the story, right? So you yourself may be the snake, right? But you'll certainly come in contact with people who need these remedies that are going to be sold. They're not going to trust or believe that they uh, work, but it's worth uh, driving that point home. It's worth continuing to encourage folk to really take um, a really honest evaluation of their feelings so that again, they don't have to be long suffering. They don't have to just go through these experiences. My, my response from my friend was, oh, I won't feel better until she's out of the hospital or until she's, and, and uh, uh, to a degree that'll be true, but you still be better. You can still feel better. You can still be present. You can still have that concern, but we still have to uh, not feel like we have to suffer also. Um, we'll talk about the personal care plan that was up on the screen when, when I first opened this um, document. That is part of it. You, uh, Most of us are in service to other people, right? Whether you're a mother or a father, whether you're a teacher, or whether you're a leader at your job or you're a, a leader in your spiritual community, we are responsible for other people, but we have to be able to care for ourselves, even if your end goal is to care for someone else. You are your star player. So again, it won't be easy to convince people to take uh, inventory of their feelings and their emotions, but it's necessary. And it, it may be difficult because these will be some negative characteristics that you'll have to face and be honest with yourself to say, oh, okay, yeah, I'm a little judgmental. Oh, okay, yeah, I am sort of self-absorbed sometimes. And sometimes, you know, I, I maybe don't, give my most honest and most sincere feelings and, and, and interaction to other people. These might be things that are not uh, favorable, but it's honest. And in order to move past it, these remedies work wonders. Uh, rock Rose, this is for the person who is easily alarmed or panicked. Uh, they have a lot of trepidation. They're always kind of trying to figure, okay, <laughs> uh, 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 the world is crazy, everything is bad, everything is in disarray. What do I do when they panic and, and you just can't function? Rock rolls might be the remedy that you need. Uh, for the person that's hard on themselves, they're often overworked, they're rigid, they uh, deny themselves pleasures of life, they just focus on all the responsibilities and things that they have to do. Rock water helps to relieve that. Uh, and again, we have to know that we are worth being free of these uh, negative emotions, these negative attributes. You have to give your permission, yourself permission to feel better and to be better, right? So let's move on to Vine. Vine treats people who are um, inflexible. Uh, they dominate it, um, more, more like a tyrant, right? Uh, uh, they're, they have a lot of pride. They think that it's their way or no way. Um, <laughs> my father used to always say, it's the highway, uh, what do you say? Um, my way or the highway, right? These type of people can be um, unbearable, right? Uh, because you get so stuck in only focusing on what you think is right uh, and what you want done and the way that you want it done. Vine is the remedy for that person. I always try to mention walnut because this is so important because we know that there's always going to be change and transition uh, in our lives. There's always different rights that we go through, right? There's puberty rights, there's adulthood rights, there's marriage rights, there's even funeral rights, right? There's always these processes that we go through, these changes, uh, menopause, divorce, um, moving to one place or another. Walnut is the remedy that helps us deal with changes that we encounter in our lives, right? It just helps us to deal with it. We know that it's going to happen. The only constant thing in life is change. We know that it'll happen. We know that it's coming. Sometimes we have a, a problem adjusting it and realizing that. Walnut will help you to do that. Another one that I've personally used. Um, I don't often mention um, water violet or white chestnut. So let's give a little second for these. Water violet, this is for folk who are proud, reserved, uh, really kind of 
really calm, uh, sedate types of people. Um, but usually they may have sort of that superiority superiority complex, right? These are people that don't really get their emotions involved. <laughs> um, and just kind of a, a kind of blank kind of person, not very emotional, that sort of thing. Water violet helps with that type of person. White chestnut, this is for people who have persistent unwanted thoughts. Like say something bad happens and you're constantly reliving it in your head, right? You keep rewinding the tape, right? Or you're preoccupied with what you think may happen or that you're afraid will happen. Um, you may have mental arguments with yourself. You're kind of having this constant inner dialogue yourself. So you're kind of taunting um, yourself. You are being attacked by your own personal thoughts. White chestnut is what we need in that situation. Uh, and then the last one I'll mention, you know, I, I do this list pretty good. I couldn't get through all of them, but Willow. I always kind of mention Willow just because I know that bad things happen to good people, right? Bad things happen to bad people, right? Whether good or bad, nobody wants a bad thing to happen. Nobody wants to be mistreated or abused or taken advantage of, right? They don't want to feel like someone has done something unfairly to them. They don't want um, a bad situation to have happened, right? And and when things happen, they may develop some resentment or bitterness, right? That's just not fair. Why that? Why poor me? Why did that happen to me? Um, when you are stuck in bitterness and resentment, another one that I have had to take in, in my life, Willow is the remedy for you. Uh, and it's really, again, it's for you. It's not because, oh, you shouldn't be resentful towards that person. No, it's so that the bitterness doesn't eat you up inside, right? Uh, I often tell this story, and it's not a good thing. I'm not being on forgiveness. I'm not saying that I shouldn't be that way. It's just what it is, right? But you have to move past these bad things that happen for your own uh, mental and emotional well-being. It's not for the person. It is truly for you. They are living their lives and they are happy, ain't thought nothing else about you, but you're still caught up in the bitterness and the resentment and the hatred. The last thing I'll quickly go over, the personal care plan. I made reference to this before. This is good to just have on hand, just to plan out when there is a illness or an outbreak or episode, uh, when you know there's a chronic condition, uh, that we know will happen, whether it's uh, diabetes or asthma or a heart condition uh, or, or things with children, an uh, ear infection or a uh, stomach virus or cold or flu. Have in mind what it is that you need to do and have on hand to be prepared for that illness, for that condition, for that situation. This will make your life much easier. You can create it for the different people in your household or on your compound. If you're the caregiver. It could be you yourself. Sometimes when we're in the height um, and in the moment of a uh, traumatic health crisis, you're not thinking clearly as to what to eat, what to drink, what to take who to call, um, how to calm yourself, who you can get to support you, and then at what point you may need to seek assistance from the doctor or to go to uh, the emergency room or urgent care or something of that nature. So the personal care plan, I think, plays a good pivotal role in terms of know when you need to get help and what things you can prepare. Uh, so my time is up. Uh, we'll talk next week about cleansing and detox the body and different organs in the body. Uh, and so thank you for joining. And as always, I bid you good health and peace. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Shana, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. But I can see that there is uh, a question in the comment section. Yeah, maybe you can follow up with them. Yes, you're going to continue with the Pan-African history uh, class with the Dr. Tyreen, right? Yes, Dr. Yes. Wright, can you hear us? Hello, I'm here. Hello, hello. I don't want to be on camera a second, <laughs> but hold on. I'm going to uh, move to a position where I can be on camera. Some of you may know where I am. Uh, Sinclair is in place, but I'm... I just finished traveling, so 
I am uh, not in my normal space today. Uh, that being said, I want to continue the conversation and um, <clears throat> about Malcolm and but advance it because um, part of what we are doing with the Pan-African connection is, you know, establishing that you know the history. So <clears throat> I'm moving backwards and I'm going to establish uh, what I discussed yesterday, which was, not yesterday, last week, <laughs> which was the relationship between the philosophy of Malcolm X as he would be in the uh, nation and the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Um, so I, I touched on both of them and last week. And I'm gonna share just a brief blip of um, the documentary that I mentioned. Uh, of course, people are uh, <laughs> interrupting me because I'm, you know, I'm out of town, coming into another town uh, for an event. But um, okay, um, I'm out of town, coming into town for an event. So um, you know, there's a lot going on. But I've already cued what I wanted to share with you all, which is that a blip from the documentary "Make It Plain." And I'm gonna share in real time uh, the chapter you all didn't get from me, but the last cycle did um, on Booker T. Washington Pan-Africanism and Pan-Africanist, which actually gives you some primary information between Garvey and Booker T. Washington, establishing the nature of that organization Okay, so I'm about to share that with you. I'm gonna share my screen really quick and then I guess you will see me. <laughs> okay, hold on one second. Let me see. Hold on one second. Well, I'll keep talking while I do that. It's open. One moment. I have so many things open related to getting from point A to B. Okay, so here we go. Uh, where's my share? Okay. Share. Share. Sorry. Okay, so this is um, one of Malcolm X's uh, siblings discussing their formative years. And notably, what, what's the point of me showing this to you? What I'm doing is giving you primary evidence as to the origins of Malcolm X and his father's involvement in the Universal Negro Improvement Association. A lot of people don't understand that. And what I was uh, discussing last week was um, Ma Malcolm X's Pan-African activity in traveling the world in 1964, but uh, having come from a Pan-African, uh, African nationalist household, he had serious foundations. So in fact, Malcolm's story is not a story of uh, transformation as much as it is a story of uh, return to his original roots in as far as the Garvey philosophy, the Universal Negro Improvement Association philosophy. So here's a blip from Make It Plain. It is one of uh, the better documentaries on Malcolm. And I just wanna, I'm gonna share that with you briefly, okay? And when we woke up, fire was everywhere. And you could tell me if you can hear Everybody it. Yvonne, can you all hear that? Into the walls and into each other, you know. Well, what I recall Yvonne, can you hear about that? that was my mother telling us. Yes, you can hear it. Get up, get up, get up. Okay. on fire and to get right. out. Okay. That's what I actually recall. I could hear my mother yelling. I hear my father yelling. And so they, they, they made sure they got us all rounded up and got us out. 
The house burned down to the ground. No All fire right, wagon I'm came. I'm going to take it back just Nothing. a little bit, but... We were burned out. Let me just say. So their father was um, a recruiter of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And um, because of his activities where they lived, they were threatened and had their house burnt in the middle of the night by the Klan or the local Klan. This should ring uh, a bell because Malcolm would experience something similar once he leaves the nation. Um, his home was firebombed in the middle of the night as well uh, because of, you know, his, um, you know, the going on between him and Elijah Muhammad and particularly um, because his public stance. Malcolm's father, Earl Little, accused local whites of setting the fire. The police accused Earl and arrested him on suspicion of arson. <laughs> the charges were later dropped. In the city where we grew up, whites would refer to us as those uppity niggers or those smart niggers that live out south of town. In those days, whenever a white person referred to you as a smart nigger, that was their way of saying, this is a nigger you have to watch because he's not dumb. My father was uh, independent. He didn't want anybody to feed him. He wanted to raise his own food. He didn't want anybody to exercise authority over his children. He wanted to exercise the authority, and he did. And he was always... So that's speaking. Malcolm X's father, if you've never seen an image of him. In terms of Marcus Garvey's way of thinking and trying to get black people to organize themselves, not to cause any trouble, but just to do, to, be, to work in unity with each other toward improving their, condi their conditions. But in those days, if you did that, you were still considered a troublemaker. In the 1920s, Marcus Garvey, a black nationalist, preached that black Americans should build a nation independent of white society. With membership in the hundreds of thousands, Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association sought closer ties with African countries. The UNIA had its own flag, its own national anthem, and an African legion pledged to defend black people at home and abroad. The U.S. Bureau of Investigation labeled Garvey one of the prominent Negro agitators. The federal government deported him in 1927, but Malcolm's parents remained Garveyites. Earl recruited new members. Louise wrote for the Garvey newspaper. My mother is the one who would read to us the Garvey paper, which was called The Negro World. And she also would talk to us about ourselves as being uh, independent. We shouldn't be calling ourselves Negroes or niggers and that we were black people and that we should be proud to call ourselves black people. What is your real name? Malcolm. Malcolm X. Uh, is that your legal name? As far as I'm concerned, it's my legal name. Would you mind telling me what your father's last name was? My father didn't know his last name. My father got his last name from his grandfather and his grandfather got it from his grandfather who got it from the slave master. The real names of our people were destroyed well, during was slavery. Any, was there any line, uh, any point in, in the uh, genealogy of your family when you did have to use the last name? And if so, what was it? The last name of my forefathers yeah. was taken from them when they were brought to America and made slaves. And then the name of the slave master was given, which we refused. We reject that name today. You mean, you, mean to... you won't even tell me what your father's supposed last name was or gifted last name was? I never acknowledge it whatsoever. September 1931. Malcolm was six years old when his mother had a premonition. Uh, we were all at the house and we had dinner, supper together. And my mother was holding Wesley, who was my youngest brother. And, and she may have been nursing him because she was at the table and she fell asleep, nursing, holding the baby. And my father had gotten up and went in the, in the bedroom to clean up, to go down and collect money. And she woke up and she said, Earl, Earl, don't go downtown. She said, if you go, you won't come back. 
That night, around 11 o'clock, Earl Little was found in an isolated area outside Lansing. His body almost cut in two by the wheels of a streetcar. The police reported Earl Little's death an accident. There was uh, a cloud over that whole issue uh, because at the time uh, it was perceived that uh, rather than a, an accident with a streetcar, that uh, Earl Little had uh, really been pushed under the wheels of the streetcar. As a matter of fact, I remember hearing just that language that he was probably pushed under the wheels of that streetcar. My father's death caused a great, great shock in the family because he was the power. He was the strength. We were organized. We were a structured family. When I get out of school, when we got out of school, me and my, my brothers and sisters, we'd come right home and go to work in the garden, clean up the chicken shed and get ready for the night and get up in the morning and all this. We'd pump the water and bring it in the house and all this. This was while Dad was alive because to not do this brought the consequence of a whipping. So we were disciplined. And uh, then after my father got killed and my mother's inability to run as fast as I could run or Malcolm enabled us to get away with a lot of things we wouldn't have tried to get away with. So we got looser and looser. Louise Little struggled to raise her seven children through the years of the Great Depression. She's reduced to where she has no income. She tried to get, she got jobs. She did, she was a proud lady. She had a lot of pride. She sewed. She crocheted gloves for people. She did a lot of things not to be dependent solely on welfare. She didn't like them telling her what she could do and what she couldn't do. And this is one of the main things that devastated her more than anything else. As time went by, you could see she was wearing down. For seven years, as Malcolm grew into adolescence, his mother slowly withdrew from her family. Two days before Christmas, 1938, Louise Little was diagnosed as paranoid and was sent to Kalamazoo State Hospital. When I came home from school one day and she wasn't there. I can remember being empty because my mother had never left us. And I felt, you know, the pain of her being gone every day. And uh, it was only going to be a couple weeks. You know, she was going to get better and come right back home. And it turned into years. Louise Little would remain at Kalamazoo for the next 26 years. The 13-year-old Malcolm watched as the court split up his family assigning the younger children to foster homes in Lansing and sending him to a white community 10 miles away. In the past, the greatest weapon the white man has had has been his ability to divide and conquer. If I take my hand and slap you, you don't even feel it. It might sting you because these digits are separated. But all I have to do to put you back in your place is bring those digits together. Here was a man who, in the eighth grade in Michigan, a school where I think he was the only black in his class and one of the very few in the school, had been an outstanding A straight A student, you know, who had been, in fact, the president of his class. And all the others were white in the eighth grade. Obviously, he had to be exceptional to be those things. And then you had the Malcolm who had left school and who had gone to Roxbury, Massachusetts, where he had gotten his first exposure to what might loosely be called hustle. Most people have no clue that in 2023, the best way to make money on Amazon is not. Okay, so I'm going to... I'm going to stop it there. Stop it there. And um, you'll actually see me. <laughs> uh, so 
really, I, I'm just showing that to establish that, you know, Washington, not Washington, no. Malcolm's origins were in fact, um, <clears throat> were in fact that of a, that of a staunch Garveyite uh, household. Okay. Can you all still hear me? Because I'm getting some kind of notice. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. All right. So it's just confirming that I changed that, that I uh, closed that. So I'm going to leave that there. And then I'm going to uh, share with you what you will read in... Um, the document that I'm sharing or the chapter that I'm sharing. So Yvonne, you and I, I guess we should talk because I, I was asking what week we were in last week. Um, I've revised, um, I've revised some things. So I wanna know when and if I should post it, but okay, so. I'm going to share Booker Tashin and Pan-Africanism and Pan-Africanist. And there is a particular section. Uh, and I'm going to come on real quickly. You'll see me. <laughs> You'll see me. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share uh, this document. Let me see screen share again. I'm going to share this document. And I'll stay on camera this time uh, to give you evidence of essentially uh, Booker T. Washington and not even Booker T. Washington, evidence of Booker T. Washington's relationship with Marvy, okay, more important. And um, why is that notable? So we're talking about Malcolm. Last week, we talked about Malcolm's international activity as it related to uh, his travels in 1964, which ultimately was the year prior to his death, his assassination. Uh, but the point of it all is, is that the origins of Malcolm X philosophy, the world had everything to do with the philosophy and his own personal foundations with the UNIA, which was the Garvey movement. Uh, I think I had it in sections here. Hold on one second. Um, so I'm gonna share this chapter in the group, but also I want to, uh, hone in on, on Marcus Garvey. And this is at the end, but you'll read, you know, hopefully you all will read the whole thing. Marcus Garvey, on the other hand, was inspired both in theory and practice by Booker T. Washington to build the UNIA and serve African people in the realm of African diasporic, in the realm of African diasporic history. Garvey's Garvey was said, <clears throat> Garvey was said to find the African population in America with a wishbone and gave them a bad, <laughs> this is a fallacy, the philosophical position and literal presence of Marcus Garvey in the U.S., is not existent without Booker T. Washington. Philo philosophically, Garvey adopted Washington's views of self-help, race pride, and independence, which were also the foundational principles of the Tuskegee model, according to Garvey. The UNIA was modeled after Tuskegee, and the historical facts reveal Garvey would not have entered the United States without Washington's successful opposition to the African exclusion measure which was designed to lock out the thousands of Africans from Caribbean, Central South America who had labored on the Panama Canal. Washington's effort 
did not stop providing in the wake of his death, Garvey entered the U.S. in March 16, specifically to visit Tuskegee, four months after T. Washington's death. And a little over a year after the race measure was defeated in January 1915. So in a multitude of ways, Washington made the emergence of Marcus Garvey and the UNIA in the United States possible. What Marcus Garvey would do is plant his seed of Pan-Africanism in the fertile ground known as Harlem. He was a combination of the 19th century Pan-Africanist that already existed in the US, but his unique contribution was the reassertion of nationhood for African people. So, and if, I mean, you guys know what Marcus Garvey looked like. Um, Marcus, Mosiah Garvey, the founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, who launched the first mass organization of the African world from his base in Harlem. Um, this is rare, and you'll see in the chapter, this is the first international conference on the Negro held at Tuskegee in 1912. And why do I have this image here? This image is important because this is the uh, place and the conference where Marcus Garvey finds out about Tuskegee in particular, and he finds out not just about Tuskegee, but the sustainable program that Tuskegee has going on, right? Producing all that they consumed. Ultimately, the eight educators that did come from Jamaica that attended this conference would go back to Jamaica, share everything they saw at Tuskegee. It, that is how Marcus Garvey is in fact inspired to initiate the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which Malcolm's father would eventually be a member of. So there's very, you know, very interesting connections there um, in terms of how we are ideologically um, connected. And there is this dialectical relationship going on between all of us. So even what we're doing like today and what we've been doing and I love black people connecting African people, black people globally, this is not the first time that we are doing this, right? This is um, sort of uh, in the tradition of what our ancestors did in addressing oppression and exploitation. We were endlessly connecting, organizing, collaborate. And so the conference here, the international, and this is an original image, as bad as it looks, <laughs> it's an original image um, of the photograph uh, that comes from Tuskegee Archives. It was, um, these are people from all over the African world uh, coming to Tuskegee to engage in this conference, which basically shared best practices in various industries, 44 industries, to be shared with the African world as they saw fit. And they were basically around the concept of sustainability um, industry. And if you know, or I will tell you, the UNIA is completely, was completely founded and based off of that having multiple industries. This is why the Universal Negro Improvement Association had so many businesses that they acquired, okay? Um, so one of the things notable in this conference is that at this conference, there would be a resolution that uh, initiated or was to initiate the building of a Tuskegee-like school in Jamaica. Those eight educators would bring that information about the resolutions to Marcus Garvey and to the people of Jamaica. Early in Marcus Garvey's history, you will find that he is traveling around the Caribbean seeking to raise money to build a school. What school? The school found in the resolutions of the 1912 International Conference on the Negro. Uh, so there's that connection. He is not uh, successful at that, actually, he being Garvey. 
Uh, but he it does manage to spread the UNIA and he models the Tuske uh, t the UNIA after the Tuskegee model. Ultimately, Washington invites him to come to the United States and particularly to Tuskegee to see the model in practice. And he does come, but he's four months too late. Booker T. Washington has already died in November of 1915 and Marcus Garvey arrives in March of 1916. Um, so they miss each other by four months. That being said, he would see Tuskegee and he would go on to New York where he would begin trying to organize and establish the Universal Negro Improvement Association. So this chapter uh, gives you that, those connections, okay? I was trying to find the portion of it that you'll read uh, where it talks about the connections, not just the small part that we read, but, um, okay, here we go, right? There was a philosophical connection between Booker T. Washington and Marcus Garvey, which eventually influenced Malcolm X. For example, who was the product of a strict Garveyite household and later joined the Nation of Islam. Embracing the Nation of Islam was not a leap for Malcolm X and his siblings who were also members of the Nation of Islam. In many ways, Malcolm returned to the values and principles of his parents. Both organizations believed in race pride, self-help, and economic empowerment. The UNIA, which his parents were dedicated members of, had an unprecedented impact on the African communities around on African communities around the world. Through mass organization. Garvey's goals included unification, establishment of economic, establishment of an economic base for African people, and a free and liberated Africa for Africans. But these objectives never came to fruition. However, what he did do was unparalleled. Never before or since has any single person or organization appeal to the consciousness of African people throughout the world at the same time, like the UNIA led by Marcus Garvey. So just so you all know what the chapter, the name of it is, it's called Booker T. Washington, Pan-Africanism and Pan-Africanist. And, um, you know, so I'm just basically part two of the Malcolm adding Garvey into the connection so you can understand a little bit more in a concrete way. I gave you more Malcolm last week, but it occurred to me prior to last week that I had never lectured on Malcolm. And so uh, in the three years that we've done this, I never exclusively lectured on Malcolm X. Um, hold on. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I never ma um, lectured on Malcolm X, so it was important for me <laughs> to at least do that and so that you all could have that. And he is a notable Pan-Africanist, okay? He is... Um, Yes, uh, Dr. Rick, can you hear us? Yes, uh, Dr. Rick, can you hear us? Uh, you are on mute. He was fertile ground because of the philosophy and the tradition that he grew up in. So you're not taking my word for it. Uh, let me right now uh, post, make it plain in the group for you. Sometimes I... And remiss in 
I'm going to post make it plain in the uh, Telegram group. Okay. And so you can watch it in its entirety. So there it goes. This is probably the most um, full, best full length documentary on Malcolm, his origins, uh, you know, and uh, the philosophical line that he followed. And secondly, I'm going to post in real time what I just, well, I can't do it. Hold on. I'll do it as soon as we go off. But that particular um, text that I just read from Booker T. Washington, Pan-Africanism and Pan-Africanist. Uh, yeah, so it's not letting me do. But, um, okay. So uh, just to recap what our letter was, part two of Malcolm, the uh, UNIA slash uh, Malcolm and Nation of Islam Connections. And ultimately, um, you know, this understanding of our tradition of a dialectical relationship. Also, let me just let me just um, cite what I opened up here because it actually is already posted in the group, but I have to repost it because I know that we've uh, we have a new group of students in here. So we sort of have a continuous thing going on in um, Telegram. And I'm gonna, let me see if I can share it again. Okay, I'm sharing it, the same document again. All right, it's not uploading because I'm actually in it. All right, well, that being said, um, let me just, the document, I'm gonna cancel that. Um, I want you to see the quote at the beginning of this chapter about our dialectical relationship meaning our continuous dialogue about our condition. And then if no one has questions uh, and on time for once. Okay. Can you all see that document? Yes. Hello? All right, I don't know why I can't hear you all. Can you hear me? Okay, all right. Yes, good. you can. <laughs> I'm like, do you hear me? All right, so um, you can see the document and you can hear me, yes? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so I, I was wrapping up, but I just want to show you all what you're going to be reading. So you're good after, but um, the quote that of the chapter and it says there is however a tie which few men can understand which binds the american negro to the african negro which unites the black men of brazil and the black man of liberia which is constantly drawing into closer relations all the scattered african peoples whether they are in the old world or the new i rarely met in america any one of my race who did not another show a deep interest in everything connected to Africa. The millions, some people question that, but this is washed. Uh, the millions of Negroes in America are almost as much interested, for example, in the future of Liberia and Abyssinia as they are in their own country. There is always a peculiar and scarcely defined bond that binds one Black man to another Black man whether in 
Africa, Jamaica, Haiti, or the United States. And you know, I think, I don't uh, this uh, relationship that we have in terms of strategizing and our reality and our um, desire to uh, to eliminate oppression and exploitation. So um, I think, and so I'm out of my element. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, in route. I'm actually in route to Tuskegee um, today. So I will be um, there and uh, yeah. So I am because we are. And, and let me just share. I don't know, because I don't think, I don't know if Sinclair Skinner shared uh, earlier today where he's at, but he is in Tuskegee and I'm on my way to Tuskegee. And he'll be um, the convocation speaker at um, the institution after 27 years or 23 years or something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's it's a, a big um, event tomorrow as far as that's concerned. And um, yeah, so I'll be talking about the very place I referenced today and the fact that you could find um, Malcolm X's philosophy rooted in Tuskegee from Washington to Garvey from Garvey to, you know, yes, people in the uh, nation of Islam um, and ultimately to Malcolm. So um, we have always had that tradition in terms of passing on the philosophical line of liberation for us, okay? Anyway, um, I am because we are and stay safe until next week, okay? Yes, uh, thank you very much. That's okay. all right. Thank okay. you. Yes, stay safe and because we are. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.